excuse me. Well, this morning we're looking at um, probably one of the most controversial passages in the Scripture, and that is what Jephthah did when he made a vow to the Lord and what exactly he did uh, with his daughter. That's, that's the big question. Uh, was this uh, the, perhaps one of the greatest acts of wickedness that the Bible records, or was this the actual faithful carrying out of a vow and not doing something that was sinful? Um, either way, whether it's a good example or a bad example, this is a vow, and this is essentially how it works. But again, there are, of course, things we can't vow, and we'll, we'll take that into account as well. But what I'd like to do is just begin by reading the chapter. It's not a short chapter. Uh, Judges chapter 11, so I'm going to read it relatively quickly. We're really just going to focus on the vow itself, which is in verses 30 and 31, and the carrying out of that vow, exactly what did Jephthah do, okay? But here's, here are the circumstances surrounding this, and again, remember, all of this is God's Word, and it was recorded for us so that we might learn. So let's pray the Lord will help us to learn what He wants us to learn through it. So beginning in verse 1, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons uh, grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Top, and worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah, and they went out with him. It came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. By the way, that's a vow. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. And the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all the, his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, What is between you and me that you have come to me to fight against my land? The king of the sons of Ammon said to the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up from Egypt, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok and the Jordan. Therefore return them peaceably now. But Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the sons of Ammon, and they said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the sons of Ammon. For when they came up from Egypt, and Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they also sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they went through the wilderness... Um, and around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came to the east side of the land of Moab and they camped beyond the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab for the Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of, of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land to our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people and camped in Jahaz, and fought with Israel. The Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, uh, the inhabitants of that country. So they possessed all the territory, the Amorites, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok, and from the wilderness as far as the Jordan. Since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you then to possess it? Do you not possess what Chemish, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we will possess it. Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive with Israel, or did he ever fight against them? 
while Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and in Aurora and its villages and in all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, 300 years? Why did you not recover them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge, judge today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. He struck them with a very great slaughter from Aror to the entrance of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karamim. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, I and my companions. And he said, go. So he sent her away for two months, and she left with her companions and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to the vow which he had made, and she had no relations with a man. Thus it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. As I said, it's a lengthy chapter. May the Lord uh, bless his word now to our understanding. Well, this morning, as you already know, we had the privilege and the blessing of receiving three new members, of each of whom we are now to pray for and encourage in the Lord with the gifts that he has given to us as members of the same body. And they've also had the privilege and blessing of being added to the Lord's church and again, what I mean by that, of course, is his visible church because they entered the invisible church when they trusted in the Lord Jesus. We don't have the keys to the eternal kingdom of God. We only have the keys, if that make, expression makes sense to you, to the temporal kingdom of God, either to admit or to keep out of the church membership. We don't have the ability to keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. Of course, we wouldn't want to keep people out. We'd want to bring people in. But they entered in when they trusted Jesus. And now having been examined by the session and having professed their faith, they have joined themselves with us. Now, when they did this, um, as we saw just or heard just a few moments ago, they told us that there were certain things that they believed. And this is their profession, their profession of faith. They believe the Bible is God's word. They believe there's only one God who is triune. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God who became a man to save us. They confess that they have repented of all their sins and that they are trusting in what he has done alone for their salvation and not what they're doing. That's their profession of faith. But at the same time, they also committed themselves to doing certain things, doing what every believer will do, will desire to do, because they have the Spirit of God, what our Lord Jesus clearly calls us to do, and that is having submitted to the Lord Jesus, to Jesus really as their Lord, that they would turn from the world, fight against the devil, put off their sins, and by the strength the Lord supplies, live the life he calls them to live. And again, we've made the same commitments, haven't we? Now, they also promised that they would faithfully attend his worship, use their gifts to serve and support the fellowship, and listen to the elders if they should begin to believe or do things that would uh, be harmful 
to them or to others. Now, these commitments, these promises that they've made are called vows. A vow is an act of worship to the Lord. Uh, It's something that we are to make in the name of the Lord only, with God as our witness, where we ask Him for His help and we promise Him something in return. Now, it may not have seemed that way when these vows were made, but essentially we have because these men have, have essentially asked that they might enter the Lord's church and enjoy all the privileges and blessings of the fellowship and the gifts, uh, the communion we have with one another's gifts, uh, that being a part of this church, this visible church, will actually bring to them. And in return, they have promised to give to the Lord what it is that He desires, and that is their love and their service and their worship. That's what the Lord desires, really, of, of each of us. Now, many of us here, as I've said, have made these same vows, so we have bound ourselves also to to pay these vows. Remember what Solomon writes? I told you I was going to bring it up again. I'll bring it up here. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than than that you should vow and not pay. Now, I read that beforehand so as not to you know, surprise you afterwards as to what you had just done. You know, you, you, you made these vows as we all did in the clear light of these passages. And as I also told you earlier, Jesus reminds us that this really applies to everything that we say, every commitment we make. He says in Matthew 5 verse 37, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Yes, I will do this. No, I won't do this. I, I, had, I do believe it's important, as I've been emphasizing, that we, we keep our word. And hopefully that's something we've been seeking to do. I had a friend who um, took this very, very seriously. And I could not get him to commit to doing anything with me. This is when I was younger and we had time to do something. You know, you want to go do this, you want to go do that. And he wouldn't answer yes or no because he knew if he said yes... He would be committing himself to doing that, and he didn't want to commit himself unless it was sure it was something he wanted to do. And the reason why was because of this passage, okay? So that's good, and he's still walking with the Lord today, and I'm very thankful for that. If we say we're going to do something, we have bound ourselves to do that thing, even if it ends up costing us more than we originally thought it was going to cost us. Again, as we'll see in our uh, example here, Uh, this morning. Remember what David wrote about the one who would ascend the hill of the Lord in Psalm 15 verse 4. The righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. John Gerson was expounding this one time and he says, let's say you make a contract with someone, you agree to do something for a certain amount of money, something more lucrative comes along and you're, you're tempted to ditch this opportunity so you can take this opportunity, but you've already made a commitment to do this, so you need to do this even if you, it's going to cost you in the end. That's what our Lord is really talking about here. Now, I've already said, this isn't something we do to be saved. This is something we will do if we are saved. This is worship. This is the kind of worship the Lord desires. This is the kind of spirit He has actually given to us to make us into this kind of person. Now, let's consider, as I've said, the example of this in the life of Jephthah, And let me just remind you in advance, Jephthah is one of those men listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So that might make us begin to think, okay, well, maybe he did do something that was right here. Uh, It's been pointed out to me that Samson was also in that Hall of Faith. Yes, it's true, he was, but I believe with all his faults, Samson was still a believer. Um, He was at, well, actually, we're going to bring him up a little bit later. Okay, so let's, let's consider this example. First of all, who is Jephthah, okay? Well, Jephthah, we read from our text, was a Gileadite, somebody who lived in Gilead. And Gilead was uh, something that perhaps is a less familiar name, but it refers to that that region that is just east of the Jordan, okay? Remember, Palestine is typically seen as everything west of the Jordan, But we've just read about that land, remember? This is the land that was under dispute by the sons of Ammon. This is the land that was taken from Sihon, king of the Amorites. This is the land that the Lord gave 
to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that is east of the Jordan. It was called Gilead. Now, Gilead was also the name of Jephthah's father, which might lead us to conclude that the land of Gilead was named after him, but it was actually called Gilead, I think, long before he was born. It's so more likely this, this region got its name because of the many mountains in that area. It's very mountainous. And it just so happens that the Hebrew word that means heap of stones is Gilead, which varies just by essentially one vowel in its pronunciation from Gilead. Now, understanding that these events actually take place in Gilead helps us to understand more about why the sons of Ammon were actually the aggressors in this situation. Uh, Ammon is, is not, you know, the, the nut that we harvest out here in, in the, uh, you know, actually we call them almonds, but I understand they're called almonds around here. But it's a shortened form of the word or the name Ben-Ami, which is really referring to the son of Lot. Okay, so who are, the Am who are the Ammonites? The Ammonites are Lot's descendants, the ones he had through the two daughters, which we won't get into right now. That was uh, a very uh, un uh, sad situation. But they lived further east of, um, the, of Gilead, so they were very close, and they wanted that land. Now, they had come against the Gileadites, remember, who are Israelites. They are Jews, because they claimed that they had taken that land from them when they came out of Egypt. But as we've read, the Israelites had actually taken it from the Amorites when Sihon attacked them after they asked permission to pass through his land. By this time, they had been living there for 300 years, and during those 300 years, the sons of Ammon never disputed their claim, but now they are. The Ammonites are clearly in the wrong. This is just a pretense for war so they can take this land away from the Israelites. Now, to lead them in the battle against the Ammonites, the elders of Gilead turned to Jephthah. Jephthah, we read, was the son of a harlot. Gilead apparently was not, um, uh, well, it sounds like he was having the same difficulty Samson was having committing immorality, but because he was, that's why his half-brothers basically disinherited them, him. But when they were threatened by the sons of Ammon, now that they need him, they called for him because he was a valiant warrior, because he was a good military leader. People tend to make decisions, not based upon principle, but upon self-interest rather than principle. And let me ask you, how does the Lord want us to make our choices? Self-interest? or principle. We need to make them on principle. They should do what's right, not what's expedient. Well, they made a covenant with him. If he would lead his own people against the Ammonites and win, they would make him their leader, and Jephthah agreed. So there's one covenant, but that's not the covenant that we're going to look at. Now, secondly, we see that Jephthah wins the battle, but we also see how he won the battle, and that was through a vow that he made to the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah, and when he does, Jephthah goes through the land of Gilead and the land of Manasseh, and he amasses to himself an army, and then he goes against the Ammonites, but realizing his own weakness and realizing he needs something more than just his, his own resources, he looks to the Lord for help, and we read about that in verses 30 and 31. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. You know, every time I read this, I know we're just coming to one conclusion, but we need to understand there are options in the language where this could be translated differently, and I'm going to uh, bring that out as we get here as we get to the, toward the end. But here are the elements of a vow. Lord, help me. If you help me, this is what I will give to you. So that's, that's a vow. And I want you to notice here secondly, because this is very important, the Lord heard him and he answered his request. He gave him what he desired. We read in verses 32 and 33, so Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. So the Lord helped him as he had requested. He struck them with a very great slaughter from a roar to the entrance of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, Karamim. 
So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. And now Jephthah's part. When Jephthah returned home, it was time to pay the vow. Whatever he says comes out of the doors of my house to meet me. When I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's. And sadly, the one that came out to meet him was his daughter. Now when he saw her, he was devastated to say the least because she was his only daughter, she was his only child. But even though the price was steep, since this would mean the end of his family line, fulfilling this vow, he paid it, okay, he paid his vow. In other words, when he said yes, he meant yes. He even said to his daughter, alas, I promised the Lord, I can't take it back. I have to do what I said I would do. The Lord has done his part, I need to do my part. Now finally, let's consider what it is that Jephthah actually vowed and what he did to his daughter. And again, let me just mention, this is not a uniform, uh, across-the-board interpretation. There, there are questions, but actually I think this, this sounds very reasonable to me, and I think, I think it is correct. Well, okay, first of all, what did he do? Uh, this is an example of how a vow works. Again, we need to ask the question, is it a good or a bad example? Many scholars believe that what Jephthah vowed was to sacrifice his daughter. Whoever comes out of the house, going to offer that one up. Some see it as maybe Jephthah was expecting some kind of animal to come out of his house to meet him when he returned. But some believe that whatever it was, he was going to offer it. And so when his daughter came out, he believed that he was bound to offer her to the Lord. Now, if, if that is what Jephthah actually vowed to do, I think you'd have to see that's pretty dangerous to make such a vow. I think that's the one thing we often think about when we think about this vow. What a dangerous thing. Whatever comes out of the door of my house, I'm going to offer that to the Lord as a burnt offering. Uh, what could feasibly come out of your house? That's what I would be thinking if I was going to make a promise like this. But if that's what he had actually promised, we need to understand this is one promise he should not have kept. This is a vow that he should not have made. And even if he made it, he should have never paid it. Because whatever we vow, whatever we promise, whatever we covenant to do that is against God's will, we are duty-bound to break that covenant rather than keep it. It would be sin to keep it. Now, this was the view of the Westminster Assembly as they were putting their section together on, on oaths and vows. And they, they wrote this simple statement in chapter 22, verse 7. No man, and that would include women, children, no man may vow to do anything forbidden in the Word of God. We cannot vow to do that, okay? Well, did Jephthah vow to sacrifice a person, a, a, a daughter? What does God think about that? Does he approve of that? Well, listen to what God says in, um, actually, um, okay, this, this, well, it's probably in the words of Moses, Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 through 32. He says this, when the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations which you are going in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, beware that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods that I also may do likewise? You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God. For every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. God does not approve of human sacrifice. And even when he told Abraham to offer Isaac, because that's one thing we often think about, God commanded a human sacrifice. God did not, never intended for Abraham to follow through with that, but it was a test of his faith to see if he was willing to do it, even to do something that seemed to be contrary not only to God's promises, but also to his will. He knew the voice of God, but God did not really want him to sacrifice Isaac, otherwise it would have happened. Now, if Jephthah had offered his daughter as a burnt offering, he committed a very serious sin against the Lord. But I would, I would raise this question, is this really what he promised that he would do?
for God. And here's where we need to put on our thinking caps. Here's a few things to think about. First of all, Jephthah made this vow when he was under the influence of God's Spirit. God's Spirit came upon him, and he was mustering an army, and he was looking to the Lord. That doesn't guarantee that he's not going to make, you know, a blunder, but it certainly influences you when you have the Spirit of God, when you're filled with the Spirit of God. It influences you to do the right thing. Secondly, this is something I think is very key, that it was on the basis of the vow that Jephthah made that the Lord gave him the victory. And we have to ask ourselves the question, did the Lord decide to answer Jephthah's prayer because he promised to murder the first person that came out of his, out of his house? Uh, that doesn't sound like something that God would do. If that is what Jephthah had in mind, would the Lord have accepted that and would he have given him what he wanted? I think that's a, a pretty good question to ask. Thirdly, Jephthah was actually vowing to give the Lord a member of his household, okay? He wasn't expecting an animal to come out of the door, okay? Now, again, we could ask the question, well, just exactly what's going on in his house? Does he have, like, livestock in the house in, in Mizpah? Did he expect an ox or a goat to come out of the door to sort of be the first thing out of the door to meet him when he returned? I don't think so. Listen again to what he says in the vow in verses 30 and 31. If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. I would submit to you he was expecting a person to come out of the door to meet him. And by the way, here's where the translation can vary. It doesn't have to be whatever. It's, it can be whoever comes out of the door. You see, animals, there may have been animals. I think some people have argued there were animals in his house. Well, if, I, I'm not sure. But um, animals don't meet you, you know, when you're coming home. They don't come out to meet you um, the way that a person does. I think whatever came out, he was expecting it to be a person. And whoever came out, he was intending to devote that person to the Lord. Now, that may sound strange. But realize that wouldn't have been the first time that somebody promised to give the Lord a person. Well, maybe it would have been the first time. Let's think about this. It depends on when Samson lived and it depends on when um, Samuel lived. But let's just say that it is in the Bible. It is a pattern. What did Hannah do when she was praying? You know, she was childless and she would go up to worship the Lord and she would pray and she would fast and she would weep for a child, Right? And what did she promise to do if the Lord gave her a child? She made a vow to the Lord. Lord, if you will give me a child, I will give him to you. She vowed to give that person to the Lord. And that person was Samuel. And he was devoted to the Lord. He became the Lord's. And on another occasion, I was thinking about Samson here. When the Lord came to Manoah and his wife, he said that he was going to give her a child and that this child, who was Samson would be a Nazarite from the time of his birth to the time of his death. And what he meant by that was that this child would be devoted to the Lord. He would belong to him. He would be his instrument, his judge, in this case, against the Philistines. I think Jephthah vowed to give the Lord the first person that met him. And that person turned out to be his daughter, and I want you to notice, too, that she submitted to that. She believed, you promise the Lord, you need to do it. But first, she said, let me go and mourn my virginity for two months. And again, remember, the reason why she did that was because she was his only daughter. She was mourning the fact that she had not borne children and that the family line was going to come to an end because her devotion to the Lord would mean that she would not marry and she would not have children. Rather, she would serve the Lord. And after the two months had passed, he gave her to the Lord, I believe, as Hannah gave Samuel to the Lord, likely to serve in the tabernacle, even as Anna committed herself to serve in the temple of the Lord after her husband died. Remember, she devoted herself to the Lord in this same way when she became a widow. And we read in verse 39, at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did to her according to the vow which he had made, and she had no relations with a man. Now, think about how strange that would sound. 
He took her and he did according to his vow. If his vow was to sacrifice her and reduce her to ashes, then what's the purpose of saying, and she had no relations with a man? Well, obviously she, she didn't. There's a lot of things she didn't do because now she's dead. But if the purpose of the vow was to devote her to the Lord, to serve the Lord, and that she wouldn't marry and have children, this would make a great deal of sense. So then what about the burnt offering that Jephthah promised to give to the Lord? Well, he paid that as well. The last sentence in verse 31, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering, sounds like whatever comes out of the doors of my house, I'm going to reduce the ashes for the Lord. But that sentence can just as easily be translated, and I will offer him a burnt offering. Whatever comes out of my house, I will dedicate it to the Lord, and I will offer him a burnt offering. In other words, it doesn't, the, the, the personal pronoun doesn't have to be it. It can be basically he, she, or it. But it's referring, I will give to the Lord a burnt offering along with my daughter or whoever comes out of the house to meet me. And then one last thing to consider is this. Jephthah is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 among the heroes of the faith because he trusted the Lord and the Lord gave him victory over the Ammonites he is put in the hall of faith for this very act. And the question is, would the Lord again have given him that victory? Would he be in the hall of faith if, in fact, he had promised to sacrifice his daughter, to offer to the Lord something which was an abomination in his sight? It really, really wouldn't make any sense. So it appears that Jephthah's vow was a righteous vow. But his victory came at a very high price, it ended his family line. But notice, it was something he was willing to pay because he had promised the Lord that he was going to pay it. So let me just close with, with this challenge that the Lord would also encourage us to do the same and that he would give us the strength to do the same, to pay our vows to the Lord, to keep our word to him and to keep our word to everyone else, to be men, women, and children of integrity that when we say yes, that's what we mean, is yes, that we will do all that comes out of our mouths. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's pray that he would help us.